without any waste of time, Prof, uh, let's just jump into it. Today, it gives me great pleasure and an absolute honor to welcome on this platform, a uh, full house that is Professor Thomas Huffman, uh, who is a professor emeritus of archaeology at the University of the Vets Vatasrand in Gauteng. He is the leading authority on pre-colonial farming societies in Southern Africa. Prof is the author of many research papers and highly acclaimed books on the subject. Prof, without any waste of time, over to you. Thank you very much. I thought I would begin by introducing you to my co-author, Mike Main. It's his easy style of writing that makes all of this data so accessible. Now, Mike lives in Botswana. And he's been interested in the various Zimbabwe ruins there for many years. Um, there's something like 110 of them in Botswana. And Mike's been quite worried that um, they're under threat because most people don't realize their significance. You can see from here just how attractive some of them are. Now, for my part, I wanted to correct some of the misinformation about them. The sign on the right says Majandi Ruins. There are two there, one's on a hill and one's down below. And I can remember once speaking to a Botswana colleague that, oh, that sounds like Great Zimbabwe with the palace on the hill and the wives down below. What I didn't realize that there was a river in between that never happens with the Zimbabwe culture. And in fact, rivers are boundaries and if they divide, not unite. So if you've got a ruin on either side, those guys are defending their boundaries. Well, now let me give you also the major distinction of the Zimbabwe culture. You see Mike is standing next to the stone wall. That is the palace of a sacred leader. The walls provide ritual seclusion and separate him from the rest of the population. So that's one major aspect, sacred leadership. The other is that the society had institutionalized social classes. You were born a royal, or you're born a commoner. There might be some movement in between, but it wasn't um, ephemeral. These were major categories. Now, social distinctions like that are the basis of all societies that we wish to call civilizations. And so what I wanna do now is give you an outline of the origins of the Zimbabwe culture in Southern Africa. Now the book starts with a timeline and you may want to refer, to, when you read the book, you may want to refer to this. So buy two books and you can have the timeline laid out there as you go through the sections. We're gonna start in the Limpopo Valley where you see on the left, the site of Shroda. Now in the top right, you'll see a ribbon let me find my arrow, there we go. That's the Limpopo River. So that's Zimbabwe on that side. This is South Africa on this side. Archeologists were impressed with this site many years ago because of these big mounds, these ash middens. And this was excavated in the eighties by Edwin Hanish. Here you can see the outline of an excavation. This area yielded something like 200 um, figurines. Now it turns out that this was in the upper layer. We're interested in the lowest layer, which yielded all of these glass beads and ivory chippings and things like that. And it's quite clear that Schroeder was involved with the Indian Ocean Trade Network. The network started probably in Zimbabwe a hundred years or so before. And some people moved into the Limpopo Valley probably to hunt elephant purposely for this trade. 
The trade is a little more complicated than many people think. There was the most, uh, the well-known route from along the coast from Sofala up to, at the time, Mogadishu, that was probably the most important Swahili maritime city-state controlling the maritime trade. You could go on a monsoon and dows like this, probably a little bit larger. And you could go all the way around to Arabia and India, eat curry for two or three months, come back on the other monsoon, bringing the things that people wanted, particularly glass beads and cloth. Now, the monsoon stopped somewhere around Zanzibar and you have to take another trip down to get, I've lost my arrow, oh, there it is, down to get to um, Sofala. You can do this much quicker if you take the tropical sea route from Indonesia across this, uh, this current right on the equator um, takes about three weeks or even less, a little bit more going back because you're fighting the current. There's a Northern equatorial current and a Southern equatorial current. In any case, uh, this by the way is how people populated Madagascar. Uh, you've got more than one source for glass beads and cloth and different traders. Well, the trade went on for about a hundred years with Schroeder in command. And then another group of people moved in. They established a capital at a place called K2, just a few kilometers away from Schroeder. It's very close to the Shashi Limpopo confluence which is the border between Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. And here we see a large mound with a trench through it. That's now been filled in as part of the rehabilitation process in preparation for world heritage status. Down here, there are some archeologists looking at another excavation and they're looking at this thick, thick deposit of cattle dung. This archeologist, I hope you can see him. I've got all sorts of blockages here on my screen. In any case, he's looking at uh, a midden, two or three meters worth of ash, soil, potsherds, glass beads, ivory chippings. This midden grew up on top of this cattle crawl. Now that's quite significant. Over here, I'm giving you a outline of the major changes in society. At the beginning, K2 followed what we call the central cattle pattern. That's where cattle are in the center, people live around it, and the head guy lives above at the top. Rainmaking takes place on some rainmaking hill. And in this case, it was Mapungubwe. Now, over here on this plan, on this photo, that is. K2, and up here only a kilometer away or so is Mapungubwe. So early on, back to our diagram, 1000 AD, 1050, rainmaking took place on Mapungubwe Hill. Then, 100 years later or so, the cattle were moved out. Now, this only happened at K2. Some people have uh, questioned whether this wasn't a war. Um, a Limpopo wide ecological issue. It's not. This is the only place where this happens. We have several hundred K2 commoner sites. They all kept cattle. It's only at the capital that cattle were moved out. This is socially significant because we know later the Vinda, who also had um, this royal commoner distinction, it was the royals who owned all the cattle. And we think that's what's happening here. And it's the beginning of class distinction. A little bit later, everybody leaves K2 and moves to Mapungubwe. And at that time, uh, the leadership moves up on top next to where the rainmaking takes place. A little bit later, 
a palace is built directly on top of the rainmaking area. Here's Mapungubwe. Here's a plan. Those little symbols mean a steep drop. The court was down next to, let's move over here, that thumb of rock sticking up. The court was down below. We know this because everywhere else in the town has got residential debris. This is the only open space. Men who are largely the people in the court, if they want to go and see the leader, let's call him a king, they would go up through a crack in the rock and go over to the side. When this was first occupied, there was housing at this end. Now you see it says cisterns. This is one of these cisterns here. This was discovered during the rehabilitation of Mapungubwe. Symbolically, this would have been a pool because in the rainy season it holds water. But in times of drought, that's when you have these uh, rain control ceremonies, um, they would they had made you can see a hole in the middle that was that's man-made they would have poured beer in there to propitiate the various uh, supernatural forces that are preventing the rain two of these cisterns let's go back to our plan are still available to see this one's been covered up that's why there's sandbags and stuff there well this all happened around 1200 1220 by 1250 a palace was built on top of the rainmaking area. And here is what that palace looked like. It's not much to look at, uh, but it's anthropologically very significant. It's a platform type structure. Later at Great Zimbabwe, you get freestanding walls. But this is just um, one way of separating the leader from the other people. Now that palace was here in this drawing. This is to give you, this is an artist's reconstruction of what it might have looked like. There's our court with people attending a court case, some people going up to get over to visit the king. Uh, this gives you some idea of the common area down below. It's probable that the roof should have been a little more shaggy, but then you wouldn't have been able to see how pots are placed against the side, the grain bins and things like that. These items, of course, are one of the things that make Mapungubwe famous, the golden rhino. They came from a graveyard in this area. There are something like 22 burials, three of them were in sitting positions. We know that that's a high status position and they had golden objects. Those were probably some of the earliest leaders of Mapungubwe. Well, Mapungubwe is down here at the corner of our three countries. Great Zimbabwe located over here is about 200 kilometers away. It took over political control somewhere between 1300 and 1320 AD. They did it by taking over the gold resources that Mapungubwe relied on. We have what's called a domestic economy, that's cattle cultivation and so on, but there's a political economy and that's what supports the leadership and in this case supported um, class distinctions. And for that, you need a tremendous amount of wealth. Cattle won't do it. You have to have another source. And it was the profit made from the Indian Ocean trade that made the difference. And by Great Zimbabwe taking over that trade, it outcompeted Mapungubwe. Over here, there's a picture of the palace at Great Zimbabwe. Now, if you'll remember from uh, geography, these are contour lines representing the steepness of the hill. The palace is located up there. This dark line is the inner perimeter wall. The various terraces that were located along here with houses on them for the royalty. This line is the outer perimeter wall. 
and it just marks the front of the town. It's not supposed to be a defensive wall that goes all around. It's merely marking the front. These numbers were areas that my research team and I excavated back in the 70s. Call your attention to this one. We uncovered a very dense housing area. This was a commoner housing area. We are particularly interested in something over to the side that says the midden. Here's our outer perimeter wall. This was all bare rock in here. Uh, so this is the edge of the housing. Uh, that platform where all these stones, this is probably a collapsed granary. That floor is called PW1 here. That's a 19th century uh, house. It's ceiling, fortunately for us, um, deposit, the PW2 and 3. That's all midden. And besides pottery and glass beads and stuff, stuck in a crack was this coin. This, there's the overse and the reverse. The name on here is Al Hassan ibn Suleiman. He was the Sultan of Kilwa, which is located near Zanzibar. Kilwa was the most important city state at the time of Great Zimbabwe. Some believe even that the gold controlled by Great Zimbabwe is what made Kilwa so prosperous. Well, fortunately, the Marco Polo of the Arab world, a man named Ibn Battuta, visited Kilwa at the time Ibn Al Hassan, Ibn Suleiman was the Sultan. So we know he ruled between 1320 and 1333 AD. And it just so happens that a radiocarbon date that we got from this midden is virtually the same. Well, this is what we call period 4A. This is the beginning of, Map of, sorry, of Great Zimbabwe as the capital. At this time, we get the first significant housing on top of the hill. You see all this red soil there and not quite so red soil down here. This represents house upon house, structure upon structure. Unfortunately, the public work department dug a great big hole in here in 1915, afraid that the African deposit was pushing over the Phoenician walls. Now we know that the African deposit was threatening African walls. Well, they've left on display um, this house. That's what's over here. Years ago, while this was open to the public, a floor went across and it looked like there was a central fireplace, just like Shona houses today, with a pot stand in the back. But museum personnel removed that and they discovered that this wasn't a fireplace. You see, it's much too high. Embers would have just fallen down. This was a pot stand. The fireplace is over here. This is on the side. This is like many of the houses in the housing complex. This turns out to have probably been the beer house for the king where he would have discussed various issues with his counselors and perhaps entertained various dignitaries. We have a little bit of data from those excavations. This is from a newspaper report at the time. And this structure here is this one we're looking at. Well, at the somewhat later, those. The Daga houses, the thick mud floors, started about 1280. But within 20 years, stone walling started. And this means that Great Zimbabwe is a power already to itself. The first walling is called P coursing. It's really easy to remember P for poor, the better walling, Q for quality. That's not what the architect meant when he established P and Q, but it's a easy way to remember. Now P looks like this because they're just picking up loose stone lying around the granite domes. Once they started to quarry, then you get regular size blocks. And this is a little bit of Q coursing on top of this early P wall. 
This is more P coursing uh, at Great Zimbabwe. This is a palace about 100 kilometers away. It's quite well known called Matanderi, excavated by Caton Thompson in the 1930s. This, um, it's actually blocked up these doorways. That's something that was done when you abandon a palace because you are blocking off the ritual space. You wouldn't want uh, an evil person to come in and take something from here and use it as medicine against your group. So they were blocked off. Now, this is a big palace. And it shows that by 1320, in between 1320, 1350, Mapping, uh, Great Zimbabwe had outplaced Mapungubwe and had become a state of its own. All of the Zimbabwe um, palaces fit into some kind of hierarchy. It's a hierarchy of courts. At the bottom were many, many commoner sites, each one owned by a man, and he was the judge of any problems of people within his homestead. If there was a problem between two homesteads, you had to go to a higher authority, that would be a neighborhood headman. If it was between different neighborhoods, or if you didn't like the answer, you would go to a petty chief, the first level of chiefs. We know the difference between chiefs and headmen because chiefs receive tribute. So you can tell from the documents, from the traditions, if you're dealing with a chief or a headman. Petty chiefs came under senior chiefs. This, the number is telling you how many people normally lived in the capital. Let's say we have a district ruled by a senior chief. He's got level three guys under him. They have level two people under them and they have level one people under them. So it's a pyramid. At the top, Great Zimbabwe was our first level six state. Mapungubwe was a level five. Now that's big. That's equivalent to Dingon, to Shaka, to Lobangula. These are big political organizations. But Great Zimbabwe was even bigger. They probably controlled 90,000 square kilometers. Well, I thought you might like to see what a Zimbabwe bird looked like before they got broken up or hacked up or whatever. This is R.N. Hall, Richard Hall, the first curator at Great Zimbabwe. He found this in the lower valley. Now they come in two kinds. This one is sitting, that is significant. It came from a woman's area and this was a, this represented a woman. Here we have it shown at the bottom. You have also ones that are standing. And these are male. Now, each one of these represents a former sacred leader. When a king was appointed, he's appointed with a sister. She represents the female side of the ruling line. You would pray to her for anything that had to do with women, female fertility, and so on. You would pray to the king for things that had to do with rainfall, the fertility of the land, things that affected everybody. There are seven of these from the hill. There's an eighth one, this one, which came from the valley, a woman's area. The seven, well, well let's look at this one down here. Three are on one side. They, as far as we know, they are all female. Three on the other side, they were male. That's significant because the king to get to here would have to go along the edge like that and he came in this side where there was some dentel design. The ritual sister, the senior sister, would come down through. There's a passageway like that. Have I got this right? Ah, no, she would have come down like that and enter in this side. I'll just call your attention to that little dotted line. That was actually an underground chamber. It was covered over. If you were here for rituals involving uh, these and the ancestors, you would be calling the spirits to these stones. It's quite important, I've been told by various Shona colleagues, that people don't think that Shona people worship stones. That's not the case. They were calling the answers. This was a focal point, like in the Catholic Church. 
you might be calling uh, Jesus to the cross to call to talk to him. It's they don't inhabit these. Well, they reside in the stone for a very brief time while the ceremonies are on. Okay. Now, I mentioned that that dentel design um, was important for the king. These were derived, this symbol was derived from the ridges on the back of a crocodile. It stands for crocodile. Here it is in a long part, as we saw at, um, at Matanderi. Notice it's not just, it even has a sinuous uh, aspect to it. Now, this means crocodile to all Zimbabwe period or Zimbabwe type palaces. Later, Kami palaces use the Czech design for the same, for the same uh, purpose. And it represents the bumps on the back of the crocodile. Now, we know this because of studies on Shona and Venda art. Anitra Nettleton, uh, in particular, uh, call your attention to these. These are Shona divining dice. This is, there's only four statuses, meaningful statuses. These are adult statuses. They're paired, old man, old woman, young woman, young man. Children do not have status. If you want to say, well, that's the first status, a negative status for it. But the only things that count are the um, ancestors of these two categories, the four statuses. The senior man is always a crocodile. Usually you can see it, it recognizable as a crocodile. The junior man is always a snake, and that stands for male virility. He is paired as a wife with a young woman who represents fertility or human fecundity, and it's some kind of twisted snakes because representing how snakes join. Old woman stands for unity. She is unified either uh, a brother or a husband bringing together that aspect of the family. Because it's unity, it's always two or three designs. And they're usually some miniature of the crocodile design. Now the Venda form a great source for all this symbolism. A lot of Shona people haven't liked this aspect of our interpretation, but you have to remember that the Venda were Shona. They were Kalanga, Western Shona, who took over part of Northern South Africa, amalgamate, well, incorporated Sutuswana people as commoners, and they developed a new language by a blend of um, Shona and Sutuswana. Now, the, one source of all this knowledge comes from the Venda Domba. It is a nine month long uh, initiation into adulthood. It's nine months to a year on purpose. It represents birth, well, conception to birth. And one famous anthropologist called it a, a magical tour of the symbolic countryside. It is full of symbolic aspects. Take these drums, these are used in the Venda Damba dance. The top of it is a pool. The handles are the knees of the giant frog, or sorry, of the green frog that stands around the pool. In between the, the knees are panels and they're either carved with a crocodile design or a snake design. This is in your book. Uh, you can read it at leisure. This is for the Kami period because we're using Czech design to represent male crocodile. Well, Great Zimbabwe uh, was out competed by Kami sometime between 1400 and 1450. Kami started out, all of these that are on here are different um, 
headquarters of districts. And Kami started out as a district headquarters under the king at Great Zimbabwe, but it had in it the gold area. Let me find my, there we go. This gold area was in their division. So they were able to um, outcompete. Because remember, this was the core of the political economy. And they were able to outcompete uh, Great Zimbabwe sometime between 1400 and 1450. And the ruling dynasty here at Great Zimbabwe moved up to the north to become the famous Mana Matapa, the Mutapa, Mutapa dynasty. Well, here's a plan of Kami. It's our other six level kingdom. It spread over several hundred uh, kilometers. You can, I hope you can see, it's supposed to be a dark blue here. This was a major area of commoners. I, I examined this place after um, a large scale grass fire. And it was, this area was just covered in house debris, middens and so on. Uh, this is a tiny little streamlet I don't know if it continued on over to this side because this was owned by some people that I didn't have access to. I want you to notice that um, there are little dots going all around which represent the town residences of district leaders. This was also the case at Great Zimbabwe. Um, remember that Kami would have covered something like 90,000 square kilometers, that is its kingdom did. And so it's got uh, a number of lower level leaders who from time to time must come to the capital. They, it may be that some person has got a court case from their district and they need to be there to represent the district and so on. One of those districts was the Thule block in Botswana. This is where the whole uh, concept of the book started. Here, this is the Thule circle. We call this the greater Thule area. These numbers, three, four, and so on, represent various Zimbabwe ruins and their political levels. This area had at least two level four districts between the Shashi River and the Maklutsi, and then the, between the Maklutsi and over here somewhere. Um, and these are the ones that Mike Maine was so interested in at first that started um, our book. Well, Kami was the capital from 1400, 1450 up to the 1640s. It was destroyed by the Portuguese as part of a civil war. We know from excavations that the palace, this is a plan of the palace. These are all terrace walls and this is showing you where various structures were. This is the underground room that was here. Now it's been replastered for preservation purposes, but also for tourist purposes. You can see there's some slots here. These held wooden posts. There are wooden posts here. And so this was a covered underground chamber is creating an artificial cave. And there was, a, let's look over here. There was a stairway that led you up. It was also covered. There was a fire so great that it melted this daga. It vitrified it. It, was, it had a glass surface to it. Now that's a serious fire. We know that this was bombarded by cannon and so on. And this, this passageway would have acted like a chimney, just creating a huge, huge fire. Well, we know from oral tradition that this was destroyed as part of a civil war that the Portuguese participated in. There's some disagreement over how to interpret the oral tradition. As recorded by the Portuguese, it was the king who lost the first round and he went to the Portuguese for help. And he elicited Sissando Bayao, 
Uh, this is known as the Bayao expedition in the Portuguese documents. And through the help of the Portuguese with um, some soldiers, muskets, cannon, and so on, they defeated uh, the they defeated the person at Kami. I don't believe that this is the right interpretation. I think it was an usurper. After all, these guys didn't have guns. Portuguese are the first ones to bring guns. So the superior force would have been larger. Nobody would have had a larger army than the king. And I think it's some disgruntled brother who lived in a district who challenged him, lost, went to the Portuguese to get help, came back and then beat the king. If it had been the king who won, why didn't he just rebuild the palace or fix it up? Why, in fact, did they leave? Um, the Portuguese came, as you know, 1497, 1498, around the Cape, and they've got, um, they discovered, they didn't know that there was a gold trade. They were on their way to India. They're looking for a sea route, which they did find. They didn't know that, the, that there was an Arab Swahili culture on the coast. So that they, they defeated various um, of the Swahili kingdoms, uh, states, and they built forts in various places. This is one on the coast. These are forts and other structures that they built in Zimbabwe. You can see it's very European, rectangular. What they did was to dig um, a ditch, throw the soil on the inside, put palisades there, and they had gun placements on either end. And in this case, on either side. In the middle, they had um, sun-dried brick, rectangular sun-dried brick buildings. Well, these were established from about 1550 on. They introduced guns, changed the face of warfare, and they ultimately destroyed the Manabatapa kingdom and the Zimbabwe culture in the north. But it continued on. Now, between 1640 and 1680, we know from tradition and documents, there was no senior leader in the old Kami area. That area was called Batua. The Kami um, dynasty was known as the Torwa dynasty. And we know that there were different claimants. One of them ruled from Zinjanja. It was earlier on, this was called Regina after the queen. Now it's an interesting place. Um, that dark represents freestanding, well-built walls. This is rough walling. So it's divided in half with a male side and a female side. We know that this was the wives in this area. This decoration is this area here. Notice there's some check, but it's basically, um, all of the designs associated with sacred leadership. That's not the case at Kami, where we had a really strong leadership. It's the crocodile over and over. Even when they were rebuilding, it was crocodile. This is the back of the palace, it's crocodile. But ruins of the interregnum period, that's the 1640s, the 1680s, they don't emphasize crocodile. We have some check, here's some check up here, but it's herringbone, female crocodile, it's cord, snake of the water, it's chevron, snake of the mountain. It's all of the different things emphasizing the duties of sacred leadership. That comes to an end by the way, this is not in the book. This is brand new. We figured this out after the book was done. In the 1680s, um, Danning Gombe became the capital. This was the Roswe capital. We've dated a um, post from the, what it called the palace. Let me find my arrow. That's from, And that is about 1680, that radiocarbon date. This is a great place to go to. When everything comes normal, you must visit it. 
visit it before you go to Great Zimbabwe because it's quite compact and you can see the arrangement, everything here. Well, notice that we've got quite prominent crocodile designs. This is um, this one here. This is where, this is the office of the number two guy in charge of this court. The walling facing the court also emphasizes crocodiles. You come around here, here's our front. This is the passage where we found the post and radiocarbon dit. This is the senior sisters, the ritual sisters side of the palace. So the palace is, has a gender division. And notice how big the crocodile motif is here. And you go around the corner further and look how big the crocodile motif is here. So it went from important man at Kami, duties at Zinjanja, back to important man at um, Dan and Gombe. So even though it's the same meaning to these things, there's different emphasis depending on some of the political situation. Now we're coming to an end. The last Roswe king, according to tradition, was killed at this place. This is Ntabaziki Mambo. That's 50, 70 kilometers away from Danangombe. This happened through various battles of the, what's known as the Difficani, Mifikani. This was, the last king was killed by Swazi. It is not clear that that's clear. That's according to all traditions. It's not clear whether he had moved, the king had moved his uh, capital to this place before the Difficani or if he left and went here for protection. I favor this latter one because you, you, this is a small granite massif. You can see just off to the side here how low it is. This, this is a place for protection. And I think uh, that's why he moved here. Now I wanna end with just uh, a short uh, anecdote. There's another tradition linked to the first that the spirit of this last Mambo, the last king is carried by an eagle. According to some, according to some it was a black eagle. According to others, it was a bachelor eagle. Both are quite important eagles. Well, I went there some years ago, hoping to resolve this issue. And I don't know how I thought I was gonna do this, but anyway, I went there. You're supposed to go all the way around to the west to enter one of these places. Well, that was a long trek. And the, um, the manager of the farm told me just everybody goes along a little road to the back. And as I went, there was a check design that was um, marking the king's eye. This is a military position. There's always a soldier there for to protect him. Well, sitting on this eye wall was a pair of black eagles. I thought, well, that takes care of it. Uh, it was black eagles. Well, I went along a little further and there's some bare rock down at the front here. And I was examining it. Look, you could see pick marks where they had been breaking off uh, slabs for building the walls and stuff. And the shadow went over me. I looked up and there's a bachelor eagle. Now, you know, eagles got two eyes. They can, they got stereoscopic vision. This thing had turned and it was looking straight down at me. Now, had I been a traditional Shona person, I would have been spooked by that thing. Anyway, I wasn't spooked, although I got the shivers a little bit. Um, this is kind of the situation with the book itself. We couldn't resolve, was it the Black Eagle or was it a Bachelor Eagle? And we can't resolve every issue that there is about the Zimbabwe culture. But we, we have given you a very credible overview of its origins and development. Thank you. John, I turn it over to you. Prof, wow. <laughs>
it's um i think i think all of us we knew that this was going to be mind blowing information it's it's just the wealth of knowledge you have is just impeccable um and i have to uh, put it on the record that today we've had the most um uh individuals on the call we've had the most attendees on the call than we've ever had on any of our talks so prof kudos to you and uh and thank you to all the wealth of knowledge that you bring uh, to all of us we still have 200 odd uh numbers uh, of individuals on the call and i'm sure everybody has lots of questions and before i take uh, some of the questions that have uh, come in um i just want to acknowledge all the beautiful inputs and just words of encouragement uh, that you've been uh, sending to Prof uh, via the chat, you know, saying it's a fantastic chat, that you absolutely beautiful, good information, well resourced, well researched. So thank you all, thank you all for all those um, uh, contributions. And uh, let me also let you know, um, uh, just before we kind of uh, bringing things to an end, that today uh, Professor Hoffman will be on a Radio Seven Hundred Two as well as Cape Talk. Uh, I think those interviews prof will be happening simultaneously. Uh, you can just correct me on that. Um, so the show is scheduled to start at nine o'clock, nine p.m. tonight, um, and it will run. It will run up until ten o'clock. So uh, please be on the lookout for that. Tune in, tune in on your um, uh, devices, Radio Seven Hundred Two, as well as Cape Talk, and um, you'll get to interact more. Uh, with Prof a little bit later on. And if you have any other questions that we might not be able to pick up today, uh, you'll be able to uh, call in as a listener and then uh, uh, give Prof uh, those uh, uh, questions. Now, Prof, um, without any waste of time, let me take uh, just a few questions that have been coming up um, from Anneli. Uh, Anneli is asking a question. Was it possible to use uh, the Asian trade route, see people uh, further south, uh, i.e. to Gela, uh, and then inland towards the Drakensberg? Let me just make sure I got that correctly. Was it possible to use the route to go further south? Correct. What... Correct. Um, well, you don't, you no longer have the um, the right the trade winds you no longer have them, and the sea gets really rough, as you know, south of Madagascar. So there wasn't major trade further south. There for the whole of the early Iron Age in KwaZulu Natal, they only have about six glass beads. At about a thousand A.D. eleven hundred A.D. when the very first Nguni people come into KwaZulu Natal, they've got a few more glass beads. I suppose they brought them with it because they come out of East Africa. So I suppose they brought them with them. So the, the actual trading area did not go very far below the Limpopo. It, it of course was incorporated by the Portuguese when they came around, they, the, uh, Delagoa Bay, Maputo became a major trading port, but that was later. I can't Sorry, hear you. I was, a little, I was a little bit muted there. I hope I'm audible now. Um, yes. Great one. So, um, Prof, let me just uh, see if I can just get as many questions in there. Luckily, we still have a little bit of time. Um, Charles, um, Charles asked us a question. He says, uh, what is the relationship between the people who build Great Zimbabwe and the builders of the stone circles around Waterville uh, Boven or Machada store? Okay, there is no relationship except they're all Bantu speakers. The, the <laughs> Great Zimbabwe was a Shona um, um, phenomena. We include Venda with that. The, the stone walling around Machado Dorp, uh, if that, the, the, along the Mpumalang escarpment, was that what they were asking? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. Those are commonly called Kony, K-O-N-I, which is a Sutu word for Nguni. Now there's mm. different kinds there, 
And I think there were different kinds of Nguni there. Now this is being actively researched by some people from WITS and we don't always agree, but there's no doubt that there is um, an Nguni component to them. They later get incorporated by the petty. And so it's part of that larger uh, petty uh, confederacy. But the, it's, it's, it's later, it's not involved with the Zimbabwe culture at all. Oh, all right, no, cool. Great one, let me just take two questions quickly. Um, you, on your lovely presentation there, Prof, uh, you had a, a map which was not included in the book. Uh, so there's a question from Linda, um, where, uh, oh, from Leslie, um, which says, where is that plan uh, which is not included uh, in the book, which is published? And then let me maybe perhaps maybe take another question from Linda, uh, who was asking, uh, which bed do the stone carving of the iconic Zimbabwe bird represent? Or are they uh, mythical? Well, it's a difficult question to answer because they combine human and bird elements. One of the standing ones, it's the one that was found at the front of the palace at Great Zimbabwe. It has toes, five toes, rather than three talons like an eagle would have. It has lips rather than a beak. And that's because um, it's a metaphor in stone for the intercessory role King's ancestors were supposed to play. They were supposed to go to heaven like an eagle goes to heaven, taking um, the problems, the wishes, etc., of the people. See, the king was an, he stood in between God and the people. And he could, this was part of sacred leadership. He could speak to God, but through his ancestors. And the ancestors went like an eagle. Now the, it's either a black eagle or a battler eagle, like the situation with uh, the, like with Ntaba Ziki Mambo. I, my own feeling is that it, the icon was a battler eagle. That's a very portentous bird in the great Zimbabwe area. The people there say, it flies in a straight line. It doesn't circle and flies in a straight line like it has a job to do. And one of the birds um, has got quite a short tail, which is a characteristic of the battler. But it doesn't really make a big difference. It's an eagle. It's a, it has an eagle theme because that's the significant part in the Shona worldview. Sure. Amazing. Um, let's take Eugene. Uh, Eugene says, uh, Great Zimbabwe uh, is the only place I have um, any uh, on-site knowledge of uh, from 50 years ago. Subsequently, as a plant archaeologist, um, I have become aware of how important plant available nutrients are to plant productivity. Considering the number of inhabitants and domestic stock, stock surely, after a period of time, the, uh, the nutrient status of uh, the Great Zimbabwe uh, would have been greatly reduced. And um, much, if not all of the timber would have been cleared, uh, used for construction and cooking fires. Um, have you considered uh, ecological uh, collapse as a factor in the human um, dynamics? Yes, indeed. Now that was one of the early explanations for um, the collapse of Great Zimbabwe, call it that, that it was an ecological problem. And they're quite right that they would have had to go on further and further for firewood and so on. But don't forget, this guy controlled 90,000 square kilometers. And every district leader, even at Great Zimbabwe itself, but at all the district headquarters, there would have been a special field. It's called Zunde, Z-U-N-D-E in Shona, a Zunde field 
cultivated specifically for tribute. You, you didn't, people didn't tithe. They didn't take one tenth of their produce to give. They helped as a form of tax cultivate the king's fields and the king's fields were at every district. And some of those districts didn't suffer um, over, over exploitation and so on. So produce could have been brought from all over the kingdom to feed the capital. So most, um, most of us don't believe that ecology was the main factor in the, the demise of Great Zimbabwe. It was internal politics. It was taken, oh, it was because of the competition provided by Kami, these, those other, in the other districts. Oh, yes, Prof. Um, I think, um... Um, my audio is just doing funny things here on my side. Um, you know what, Prof? I, <laughs> there's just so many questions. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and it's, it's so fascinating. And all of them are just amazing. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm just going to take one more um, question. And then um, just encourage everybody that's on the call today that um, mm -hmm. Prof will be live on Radio 702 as well as Cape Talk tonight, 9 p.m. until 10 p.m. So please tune in, uh, Radio 702, uh, as well as Cape Talk. Listen to more. I think there's going to be far more, more fascinating, more things coming up uh, from that interview that's coming up a little bit later on. It's going to be a bit more interactive, which will allow um, individuals, callers, and listeners to be able to call in and ask as many questions as possible. So in closing, I'm just going to take one more question uh, from Nick. Uh, who is asking us, Prof, uh, gold uh, is the root of this civilization. Um, is there evidence that the mono monopoly over the trade, uh, over the trade continued throughout uh, the time period? Well, that's quite a complex question. One must remember that it's gold and ivory. The um, it's ivory chippings and so on that we have at Shroda that we have at K2. So we know from Arab documents that they were running out of ivory in East Africa and they're looking for new places. And that's how they must have discovered that the Limpopo Valley was good and so on. During that, they must have discovered gold. Now, from 2000 years ago, black guys were metallurgists, but they weren't doing gold. They were doing copper and iron. And so the Arab Swahili people put a value on gold. You can pan for alluvial gold at Mapungubwe. Then you just go upstream and you find the gold reefs where it's visible. And that happened, um, well, we don't know when that, well, well, yes, it must have happened sometime in the 900s because there's an Arab document that talks about the gold coming from the hinterland of Sofala. And Sofala did not have gold. So it must have been about Zimbabwe. So early on, gold was the beginning of the, and ivory, the beginning of the political economy. But it was only a means to wealth. It's not until Mapungubwe time that it's accepted as wealth itself. And the gold objects at Mapungubwe are the first ones that have been found in the interior. So now the, the leader is going to monopolize this. According to an assessment of the documents for the Monomotapa Empire, he controlled about a third of the trade. And then there's all sorts of other people who are benefited from it is too, but they're probably paying some tribute to him in these objects, but he, he directly controlled about a third. Wow. Um, Prof, I, all we want to do right now is to keep you here with us <laughs> <laughs> for the whole day and just listen to the fascinating <laughs> knowledge that you've uh, been sharing with us. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think the, the depth of knowledge and how you've unpacked it, you know, from, you know, the pre-colonial times and uh, primitive days and 
you know, to bring it up to 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 what we see now as um, as the Great Zimbabwe is just absolutely fantastic. So, uh, kudos to you. Um, I think um, the the numbers on this uh, presentation on this call today uh, just represents the, the amount of interest that everybody has and the love that everybody uh, has for you. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, let me take this opportunity to also remind you that um, our regular Wednesday talks uh, will obviously happen again next week. In fact, next week, we've got um, an interesting talk uh, titled Too Many Mushrooms to Name. Um, obviously, we're having a Wednesday talk today because of uh, some of the challenges that we had uh, last week. Uh, but Prof, you've brought it home and um, you've done it justice and uh, exactly what people were expecting. You've given, in fact, you've given more. And um, we have a date with you tonight and we look forward to catching up with you tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, on that Radio 702 as well as Cape Talk. Uh, last uh, bit of information, we're offering 15% discount on um, a Palace of Stone. So please make sure you head over to uh, Kistenbosch uh, to our bookshop, uh, Botanical Society bookshop, and get yourself a copy of this fantastic book. Uh, all the details are on your screen as you, as you have it right now. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Uh, from my side, I wanna take this opportunity to just thank all the team that's working behind the scenes. Uh, Kathy, uh, absolute pleasure. You know, you always do amazing work bringing all these fantastic speakers and making sure that we can get all this, uh, we can be educated the way we've been educated. Uh, to Belinda and her team at Strake, thank you so much. Uh, from the Sandy team at Kistenbosch, we always appreciate being part of the talk and um, we're always looking forward to having you guys next week. So uh, from my side, remember, let's all stay safe. Um, let's mask up, let's sanitize, uh, let's maintain social distancing, but most importantly, Vaccine rollouts are out and open, so please go out, get yourself vaccinated. Let's get this herd immunity so that we can all get back together and enjoy meeting one another. I haven't hugged somebody in a while, and Prof, I think when I see you, I'm just going to give you a nice squeeze. <laughs> Hopefully by that time, I would have vaccinated as well, and I'm paying to do so soon. Uh, any last words from you, Prof? No, thank you very much for everybody participating. Awesome stuff. Prof, we have a day tonight. We'll catch you on Radio 702 and Cape Talk tonight at 9 p.m. To everybody else, thank you very much. See you guys next week. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Cheers.